namaste sagar welcome welcome to ahimsa conversations uh, so namaste uh, ji uh, what is where were you born i mean where did you grow up and what is your earliest memory of uh, either the thought or the idea or the concept or experience of ahimsa hmm so uh... i was born in igatpuri it's a small town in in nasik district um a, a beautiful town you know and uh, it's surrounded by mountains all over so yeah i was born over there in a very um, i would say in a very lower middle class family my dad was a tailor we had a small tailoring shop and the community in which i grew up we had around Eight to ten families out, and it was a mix. Uh, it's a it was a mix uh, religious group. I would say there were Hindus, there were Muslims. In fact, there were more Muslim families than Hindus. Um, and as you ask me this question, you know about non-violence, violence. I don't think you know it ever appeared to me what's the difference uh, between uh, violence and non-violence. But I can say one thing that I have experienced a lot of violence. Uh, in my childhood in in many forms you know it also depends on how we define violence you know sometimes it's very overt but sometimes it's you know it's it's hidden or it's 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 layered i would say you know for different people it affects in a in a very different manner for me uh, it mostly was uh, a i was like um, my father used to beat me a lot you know i don't know for various reasons i was like a naughty child or something you know so that was one and as i said the the community that i grew up in uh, it, there were a lot of quarrels that happened uh, particularly with this family which was uh, basically uh, they had some property dispute and as a child i i have seen these brawls and they used to hit each other like really bad they were bleeding and the police used to come you know and then the daily um, the daily fights over water and all of that so so i have seen a lot of that so i think at that time it never appeared to me about what violence is it it, it was a part a part and parcel of my life you know but however uh, my mom she is a very uh, non non violent person i would say she's very calm you know very composed so when my dad is to beat me she is to always protect me uh, from him and uh, whenever these um, this quarrel or these brawls happen she always told me that you know violence is not the way you know you you can't be hitting people and all of that so i think somehow i didn't go that uh, in that line you know uh, of of making friends with them and she was she also always kept a, a, a close check on me in terms of who i am hanging out with you know so i think Uh, it, it's it it depends i was thinking about this uh, uh, when i was seeing watching your the videos that you have posted you know on uh, the the imsa channel and i i was thinking like where it resonates with me so there was no particular very particular memory as such but as i said there was a, this myriad of experiences that i have had with violence but then there was this uh learning that i had from my mom you know but i do remember one um incident which has affected me really badly so i remember i was in um i was doing my diploma and uh, as i said we belong to a very um, lower middle income lower class middle income family so um, the house that we were living in there was some dispute over that you know that pagde system it was very complicated and there was some court case that was going on and finally the person uh, who had uh, uh, and the case against us won and we were literally thrown on the roads you know so there were police who came in and who took all our utensils whatever whatever belongings we had they were literally in our house my sister me we were all crying and our our things were just thrown away you know on the streets and we were literally on the streets with no um shelter on our head and i think that experience of how power works you know how um how some people get so violent when when they have this power that they don't think about others that that was really deeply ingrained within me you know that i should have that power and 
this is not a this is not a fair world and that's why uh, i think my earlier earlier part of my career is pretty much shaped by that the the only thing that i wanted to do was get a job and start earning and support my family you know and that's how i ended up doing my uh, diploma in mechanical engineering then my mechanical engineering you know so it's it's really lovely when i just reflected upon this entire thing so these pieces were all connecting together mm. and the, so after mechanical engineering you did get a, mm. a regular job right you worked in uh, which yeah, companies yeah. tata power tata power was my right. so sorry uh, when i when i finished my diploma actually i was as i said like i i just wanted to uh, earn for my family so i i studied really hard so i was a state topper at the time i got like 92% but then i didn't have uh, money to study further so i had to take a gap so i worked for one year in bajaj auto in aurangabad so i would say bajaj auto was my first uh, company and after that you know i saved money uh, whatever stipend i used to get at that time i saved that and then i did my engineering from college of engineering pune and then i came to bombay and my first job was with tata power yeah so you could have very much stuck to that track and risen in the corporate ladder what inspired you instead right. to join teach for india where did that come from yeah so very interestingly when i joined tata power you know uh, i never had thought about as i said i was just responding to the needs that i had at that time you know which was uh, getting a decent place for my family supporting it financially and all of that also had certain responsibilities about helping my dad to uh, get my younger sister married and all of that so once that was being taken care of there was this side of me uh, i would say a rather spiritual side of me which kind of kept questioning about where am i heading what i want to do and i was really interested in the the csr department of tata power you know so i used to volunteer with various initiatives and there was something very interesting as i said i was in igatpuri the kind of education that i had received was very uh, it was very rote learning based you know so there the skills were not focused upon so i didn't i don't think i developed like really good skills when it came to analytical and mathematical skills so i could survive till like 10th grade and then the diploma also you know where i i didn't actually apply the concepts but if i don't understand them we were always told that you know you have to just reproduce this part of it so i did that but when i came to do my btech in pune you know which was a uh, which is a, one of the best uh, engineering colleges in maharashtra i was taken aback because i didn't understand anything over there you know and i i flunked in two subjects i flunked in mathematics 3 and there was another technical subject called strength of materials and i couldn't believe myself you know i was completely shattered that how did this happen and then i realized that i am lacking in the basic concepts so i had to work really hard to get out of that situation of course i managed well after that but that stayed with me that i was the so called brilliant child you know i was um everybody considered me like very intelligent because my marks were always good so what did i lack you know and i wanted to change that in in a certain way and when i read about teach for india it was about um equipping these students from you know uh, financially underprivileged backgrounds and giving them that kind of education which is at par to these international schools that we have so basically an an access to education which which has quality not just education you know when we say that education is my birth right or everybody should have education but we don't talk about what kind of education you know what is the quality of this education and teach for india came right in that to fill that gap that we will give excellent education to these children and we will not discriminate based on where they are born what financial privileges they have so i felt that i could really contribute back you know and also i'll go to these um, communities where the students don't get an excellent education and i'll feel that happen i think that i had applied uh, for the teach find a fellowship but i was also doing really well as an engineer in tata power i had won an award adarsh power trainee award and all so you know, 
and as i said i was not like financially well off so i also needed financial resources but i was lucky enough that we had our um, managing director that time mr prasad menon was a gem of a person you know he kind of talked to me and he said hey you you have recently won this award why why you want to leave and go for this fellowship you know we could sponsor your fellowship so you come back to tata power so that was a so i would say i would i am grateful and i was rather lucky to have this opportunity to have a sponsored fellowship from tata power to go and do this two years of teaching in the communities uh, of mankhud shivaji nagar uh, in um, and govindi in in mumbai uh, yeah so i would say that that's how that shift happened great and then how did your connection with seeds of peace come about because hmm. that's a long leap here you are in bombay working for tata power and teach for india and seeds of peace at that time if i know correctly had no indian operation am i right so they had they had operation at that time uh, but they were the previous person was leaving so they were looking for the uh, india program to continue and i think uh, after teach for india i went back to tata power i also completed my masters in hr uh, from jamnalal bajaj uh, in, in the interim and then i was working with the learning and development team in corporate hr of tata power uh, so i did that for like a couple of years but then as i said my heart was already in in the social development sector in 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 the education sector i would say and i started looking for opportunities to pursue my dream and to follow my heart mm-hmm. uh, so at that time i didn't get any opportunity in education but i stumbled upon this opportunity with peace education you know so which was again working with the youth uh, and i could connect to it basically you know because as i said we were um, i was born and brought up in igatpur and there were this uh, muslim communities and then uh, hindu communities and i always got these messages from my family that you know uh, you can be friends with the muslim people but you can't be like really good friends with them you can't trust them you know i grew up with all of these stereotypes and again uh, because uh, the muslims supposedly i mean there's the stereotype that they all consume beef and you know they kill the cows and all of that so i i very much grew up with that uh, those constant messaging that you know cow is a holy animal and they they eat it so you can't be going and eating at their place you know so it had affected me in in some way and when i was teaching these young kids uh, in in govindi i also see that happening so so that always bothered me that over these years nothing has changed much you know the myths the stereotypes have continued you know and you need an educator over there like for example i i still remember i was teaching second graders and when it is to be ramadan a second uh, i mean what like 6 7 year old child you know and the parents um forcing them to to fast in the month of ramadan for you know for 30 days so i had an honest conversation with them we had a dialogue about it and like you know you can give the child a choice of course when it comes to religion it's it's their personal decisions but i i experienced that i could be that rational minded person who could get them and who can openly talk to them because i was really committed for their child's transformation and they could see that you know so so that uh, that experience i already had that through compassion and through like constant engagement with the right intention i think change is possible so when i saw seeds of peace it was about you know getting different uh, uh, communities together of course it's an international program but when we talk about the indian program it's all about that you know like how do you engage younger generation in dialogue and in personal stories you know so i think that aspect of it really uh, attracted me uh, to apply for for seeds of peace and as i said again i would say i didn't have any background in peace building at that time you know but i think uh, my manager at that time abhishek ayu when she um interviewed me i just told her that you know skills could be developed over time but i think i have the passion and i have the right experience and i i can give my 100 percent to this job and i think uh, that that's what uh, got me into seeds of peace so at this point maybe sagar it would be great if you can tell us the story of seeds of peace because uh, most people watching this will not be familiar with the institution 
So if you can give us a very brief history right. of, uh, you know, how it was started, why it was started and by whom and what is its core mission today? Right. So Seeds of Peace uh, started in 1993 uh, by a US-based journalist called John Wallach. And um, John is no more with us uh, today, but John was a firm believer of dialogue. Uh, and, and he wrote uh, three books about the Middle East and the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, and he, he understood that only dialogue between the younger generation can you know, transform the conflict because conflict is transgenerational. It, it passes from one generation to the other. If we don't have that exposure uh, for the younger generation, to meet the other side, then no change is possible. So with this thought in 1993, he started this camp uh, in, in the United States, uh, in, in the state of Maine. Actually, there's a beautiful place called Otis Field, which is like three hours drive from Boston, a 25 acre piece of land of deep into the woods. You know, it's not in a city, uh, so completely disconnected from the city life. So that is where the camp happened. And the first camp happened between Israelis and Palestinian youth. You know, there were a few Egyptians and few Americans. And the whole idea is to meet your so-called enemy face to face and have a dialogue, you know, and where it, and in dialogue, we, we um, focus on personal stories of transformation, you know, rather than talking about facts and textbooks and media narratives. So, so that's what, with that thought, Seeds of Peace began, and it's, it's a unique program which gives uh, youngsters from opposite sides of conflict an opportunity to come together and, you know, talk about their daily struggles and how the conflict has affected them. And currently we are in uh, working in Israel, Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, India, Pakistan. You know, we had the Afghanistan program, which is on, uh, currently on hold. Uh, we also have the US and UK delegations. Uh, because they have some roots in our conflict, you know, the, the Middle Eastern conflict as well as the Indo-Pak conflict. So the camp happens every year for close to a month, like three and a half weeks, where these youth come together and have dialogue. You know, every day, two hours of dialogue. Plus there are other activities that happen, you know, where they engage them in certain way, that they, they develop certain skills, and, but everything ties back to dialogue. The program is beautifully weaved in such a way that everything that happens in different activities helps deepen the dialogue, you know? So that's, that's what Seeds of Peace does. And if you ask me like, what is the vision with which Seeds of Peace is working? I would say that uh, it's a leadership development organization and we are committed to transforming legacies of conflict uh, into courage to lead change, you know? So we work with youth and educators and we equip them with exceptional skills uh, and relationships that they need uh, to work in solidarity across lines of difference uh, to create more just and inclusive societies you know so that's that's what the crux of the program is is it able to work within the us for example racial conflict is a big issue in the us and particularly in this last two years uh, it has uh, spilled over into so many street protests so right. does Seeds of Peace engage with this issue within the U.S. American society? Yes, that, that's a brilliant question. So uh, the camp happens in the U.S., but then uh, all the countries that I mentioned, Israel, Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, India, Pakistan, U.S. and U.K., have their own programs, you know. So we have program for India, for Pakistan, and so on and so forth. So in U.S. also, we have a program which looks at the challenges that they face over there, as you said, racial injustice and all of that. They engage uh, the youth in, in dialogue. Dialogue is a beautiful process. And at Seeds of Peace, we, uh, we have developed a, a, a dialogue model where we say that uh, dialogue is a communication centric and it's, an, it's a tool, basically it's an educational tool, which is guided by trained facilitators. You know? So through group work and through some experiential learning, the uh, uh, our, our dialogue model aims to explore the conflict dynamics, you know, and and the structures of power in order to support uh, positive social change. So, so be it any conflict, so as you, uh, you as you ask about the U.S. context, you know, so what are the power structures that exist, and how the participant can uh, develop deeper understandings of their self, uh, the society that they live in, and how uh, by critically questioning. Uh, 
uh, being present and you know expressing their understandings of reality how they can directly challenge these uh, things and then uh, and imagine a, a better better future for each other you know so that's how our dialogue aims which is a uh, it, it creates a space of shared and equitable power you know where there's no one who's more powerful so the power is distributed and they 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 share their personal stories they um the facilitators basically encourage critical thought uh, they they ask them to question all the assumptions that they have made uh, and and the assumptions that they have formed by uh, listening to the uh, to the media to the, the the kind of education that they have had you know so all all of these things kind of help the youngsters to share their their personal stories and also to learn from each other mm-hmm. and and that's how we engage them in in social change work now you have personally uh, been part of some of the uh, sessions where the indian youth and the pakistani youth have met at this camp in main can you share some details from that uh, you know mm-hmm. what for example did you face any difficulties then uh, that were not anticipated uh, did it uh, in any way go under your expectations or beyond your expectations what was it like uh, because at one level yeah. it's a very beautiful at an ideal level it's very beautiful and and uh, appealing but uh, what actually happens on the ground uh, in the camps that you were directly involved in if you could share that right so intentionally our camps are for for uh, a, a longer duration because you know uh, the indian and and the pakistani you would grow through a lot of uh, stereotypes and a lot of hatred for each other you know be it cricket or be it religion or be it you know naming pakistan in certain way or terrorism and all of that uh, so obviously the 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 youngsters are not immune to all of this hatred you know so they come up with all of these ideas and of course we do have certain conversations with them before we send them to the camp you know we introduce them to the process of dialogue but when they actually meet uh, and at at surface i would say they seem like goody goody and oh india pakistan we are meeting for the first time but when it comes to dialogue you know so when they start talking about uh the narratives that they have heard about partition you know um about the history so then they understand that oh the history is so different as it is portrayed in uh these textbooks the pakistani textbooks are completely opposite to what we read in our history textbooks and vice versa you know so the the narratives the facts don't match you know even the the wars that we have fought uh the facts the the things that we call facts are very different in in their part of the world you know so at first these kids are like really shattered and they really start questioning oh i mean the kind of education that i am receiving it's not fact or you know what are facts then so it's kind of an eye opening experience for them and it's very difficult for them to digest this and it it takes time and it takes a lot of um, so debate does happen though we say that dialogue is not debate but the facilitators are trained in such a way that they allow that to happen you know like uh, if it's sagar i'm just going to uh, pause you here for a second see one thing that can also yeah. happen when somebody's uh, uh, what they consider basic facts and their basic learning mm. when it is shaken in this right. way it can also trigger yeah. a very self defensive uh, response yeah. because it will True. raise the level of vulnerability uh so how do you, how does how do the facilitators navigate that moment when there is a risk that because they are feeling vulnerable they could become more defensive and therefore aggressive yeah so they do they it does happen you know they they become defensive then as i said dialogue is a process of um sharing up personal story so the the facilitators have to then step in and say you have spoken a lot about facts you know and textbooks and all of that now let's talk about the feeling then your 
own experiences in your personal stories so when you have to so i can go on and on and use generalized statements uh, and blame the government blame the people blame terrorism but when i have to share my personal story that how it has affected me so the the facilitators always encourage the participants to use i statements so whatever you can't use we or we you can't use all hindus they say okay what do you mean by all hindus so speak for yourself you know so they challenge you gently and they nudge you to use your i statements all right that's one and as i said that camp has a lot of different other elements so one beautiful uh, thing that happens at camp uh, uh, it it is called like you know a group challenge where a challenge is to be achieved you know a task is to be achieved uh, by a group so it could be a high rope all right you're walking the high rope you're blindfolded and you're with a pakistani so an indian and pakistani you have to kind of cross that high rope of course all safety aspects are taken care of there's safety harness and all of that and there are certified facilitators as well over there but when you have to do this you forget all of that you know and you're in the moment and you slowly and gradually start developing that trust and that again feeds back into the dialogue so it's a process and in the moment also the facilitators take a lot of effort to nurture that space so we say that a dialogue is a safe space it's created it is not an automatically safe they try to create the nurture that space is a safe and sacred space where vulnerability is invited as a strength you know and uh, and they hold each other beautifully so yeah so that does happen but then uh, it it kind of goes uh, a little bit uh, ahead and by the time they leave uh what you said it's 3 weeks right these this uh yeah. in the past yeah uh what is it what is the shift or what is the difference between the first day when they met and when they are ready to leave and go back to their homes in india and pakistan yeah so they become a, a lot more understanding uh listening as a virtue you know so the facilitators focus on a lot of listening skills that listen you know i mean i may still not agree with you but can i just listen to you can i uh, make you feel heard you know and i may still walk away with my opinion but at least i will try to understand where you are coming from you know and with that idea i widen my perspectives and i would i would go away with a thought that there's no one truth you know there are multiple truths this whole multiplicity of truths that each person due to their each unique individual situation has their own truth and i may not agree with it but still can i just respect that you know so i would say a understanding b they start talking about more human aspects than you know oh so what what do you wear what do you eat what kind of music you listen to how is your school life like you know so these bonding factors and they understand that oh we are just so same you know um and then there are other aspects like what is the kind of world that we want to co-create and what are we going to do about it you know what are the change making initiatives that i can take back home and what you are going to take so they work together talk about change taking initiatives and all of that so i think it's it's a it's a beautiful shift from who did what and who's a terrorist and who won this war and who was responsible for partition and how evil jinnah was how evil gandhi was you know all of that then directly shifts to all of these ideas where you start thinking about a world which you can nurture which you can co-create sahi baat hai how many and of and them keep in and at the uh, age it. group of 8th and 9th 8th and 9th grade uh, students doing this you know so that's fascinating i would say uh, sorry they are 8th and 9th grade that's quite yeah, young in, uh, when they go to the camp yeah yeah, yeah that's very young uh do you know if they keep in touch over the years because now many batches have done this exercise how many batches in yes. all sagar have done this indo pak dialogue so we started yes we started in uh, 2001 and we are in 2021 now so last year we couldn't do the camp so you can say like 19 years 19 batches have been through this so uh, the and yes they the... do keep in touch mm, yeah go ahead go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. yeah so uh camp is not just the one thing i would say the camp is just the beginning you know it's just an it is a window to 
or it's an experience i would say it's a short experience yeah. which widens your perspective it opens up different possibilities for you and you start looking at the world in a very different manner you know uh, the rigidity around my own personal opinion my own personal experience kind of little bit you know diminishes and you're more open to different possibilities so that's the only thing uh, that cam does but then when they come back we do follow programming with them you know there's a full fledged year long program which again continues with different leadership opportunities so i had said like uh, the first intensive experience that we give them is called the interfaith harmony camp you know which is a 6 days residential camp which brings uh, different youth from different religious backgrounds together where they you know the aim is to break uh, the cycle of fear and hatred by by promoting coexistence and peaceful exchange of ideas through dialogue you know where uh, different faith communities come together and understand like what faith is it is it just religion or it could mean uh, different things for different people you know so the youth get this opportunity to deepen their understanding of the world that they live in uh, and we also try to build critical thinking and help them understand that how religious polarization is actually creating mistrust and violence and how they can um engage with the dialogue process and and promote an appreciation and celebration of you know the diverse belief system that exists in our country so that's one program then we have uh, another program called critical media literacy which is basically uh, critically engaging with the media and you know asking the right question then being a passive consumer so they they go through a three days journey uh, into very beautifully uh engaging with the media and and becoming critical thinkers then we have be the change which is a leadership development program then there's a peace fellowship it's it's a year long peace fellowship where uh they engage uh with uh, what is peace what is positive peace what is negative peace what is conflict what are the tools that you can use to analyze conflict what you can do about it you know uh, then building skills like listening mediation skills negotiation skills uh non violent communication so there's a lot of uh, programs that we do with them and a current program called the samvad project it's it's a it's a pioneer program it's first of its kind in in the entire country where we have selected 35 professors from five states of india maharashtra uh, madhya pradesh gujarat chhattisgarh and goa these are from goa, colleges and undergraduate colleges colleges yes and we are training them on interfaith dialogue facilitation and we just finished the first phase of 8 uh, weeks uh, every day we uh, not every day every week twice uh, we met online for 2 hours so 4 hours a week and plus we gave them a lot of free read materials and all and we created a very deepened understanding of what is interfaith you know it's various cross sections like the caste system that we have uh, gender sexuality so these various cross sections privilege identity that go hand in hand with interfaith we we explore that layer by layer you know and it was so beautiful to have all these uh, professors most of them were like phd's double phd's to kind of engage with interfaith uh, and amidst so much of um, bandage that happening around covid right now you know so much it's so difficult some of them had family members going through covid some of them were diagnosed covid positive but still that commitment you know to come and be on the sessions and and engage with the community uh, i was really surprised with that commitment level and and the need of such initiatives you know the the program is supported by the us consulate mumbai and it's just beautiful and we are hoping to take this to the next level by training them on interfaith dialogue facilitation and then they will take this uh, to their uh, their their colleges you know so it's not just the camp i would say we work with educators we work with this college professors we do we engage with teachers also uh, and, and students alike and then further they take this uh, by by getting trained so even youth we train as dialogue facilitators they can go and in schools and and hold dialogue spaces for other students also you know so so there are uh, uh, ample of opportunities for them to exercise their leadership skills and also to uh develop the capacity as a young leader and the fundamental premise as i am understanding what you're saying is that dialogue is the first step towards nonviolence yes 
that's that's that, you just got it that's the crux of what i'm trying to tell you yeah you know i was wondering one small detail that how do you uh, do the children who go from here both india and pakistan to the camp in the us do they have to pay for themselves or the uh, seeds of peace uh, 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 gives them a stipend because that would yeah. determine so, whether only very well off well to do upper class children get to go or a wider variety can go right so till recently very recently the program was fully funded and we had a huge grant um and we covered all the expenses for the students so we didn't charge them anything however now uh, we are looking for various funding streams so as of as we are speaking now the program is um, a mixed model where uh, when we talk about peace building diversity is is a very impo- important component so even in the delegation that we send to the us have various type of diversity imbibed uh, internally you know so we have students from lower income families we have students from really elite families so whoever can afford can they they pay for the camp you know and i would say we work around like say 70 30% where 30% pay and 70% we raise funds and there are scholarships available so we have because uh, they don't have the financial capacity to pay so there are scholarships available uh, a lot of our students go on full scholarships uh so that's also there yeah okay uh, do you want to add any details about the program that you are now running at the school level in bombay uh, anything particular that you want to share because uh, i imagine that you're doing much of the same work basically promoting dialogue yeah uh but is there right. any detail any dimension of it that you would like to you know uh bring here as an illustration of the possibility of non violence yeah. right so next month we are launching a, a co leadership program you know uh, so uh, we are just working on that and it will have um, a lot of components of what i just shared right now you know where where there is dialogue there's interfaith dialogue there's uh, leadership build leadership development you know plus we are launching a new program on humanistic leadership you know like what are the values as a young leader you can imbibe from right from this age so that you become a humanistic leader you know uh, moving forward uh, how do you exercise conscious leadership uh, what are those values and approaches so we are going to talk about that as well plus there are other programs like there's a program that we are which is basically uh, engaging critically with all the social issues that we are uh, amidst right now you know the, the farmer suicides the the farmer strikes that are happening and reservation issues and all of that and how this younger generation can uh, instead of looking at it as as an one off thing how they can look at the larger picture and how these small small things fit into that you know so that they can have a holistic understanding of that so we are going to launch that next month and uh, i would encourage uh, the schools that are the school principals rather i would say who are listening to this conversation if they can get in touch with us uh, we can we can partner and we can have the students uh, for our programs bilkul uh, in closing sagar uh, uh, i want to just ask you to address a rather broad challenge that given the fact that uh, very few in numbers very few young people will be able to engage directly with your process right that's the nature of yeah. the uh, uh, inevitable in the in the model uh, but we know that from just everyday interactions that there is a large number of young people who are drawn to nonviolence uh, at yeah. least they want to explore it but they also feel daunted they think uh, oh uh, you know how can i do this i am so ordinary or only or there is this uh, wrong impression in many young people's mind that non violence is for saints for mahatmas right. so what uh, can you give some specific advice to young people one about what what strengths they can build within themselves and how 
and yes. how they might uh, i mean firstly do you share their sense of diffidence if you you maybe you did mm. at one stage in your life yeah so you could perhaps share sure. from that time your own experience but now after all mm. this rich experience that you have drawing on your own right. experience what is the ad creative advice you would give them brilliant okay uh, so first i'll address the first part where uh, yes the international camp uh, very few students get to go but our other program that we are trying to do uh, uh, hundreds of students participate in that especially the interfaith harmony camp we had around 60 to 70 students who go for that and various other programs we do batches of like 30 30 again it's not like thousands of students and as you said the the need is there and we are trying to maximize our program so like for example this the samvad project which is there uh, it will reach to five states and through these professors it will go to hundreds and thousands of students and then we are further going to train them to reach out to different schools so what i would say is you know um, violence and non violence these are there are big words i would say and as you said like students really get intimidated by that and they start connecting it with uh, saints and are in non violence kya hai gandhi ji bapu and all of that instead of that i would say that you know the culture of dialogue is very important we can start with the basics and we have start doing uh, we have started doing that actually you know um 6th 7th grade uh, grade students how do you uh, work with them and into the day to day life you know the discussion that are having how how you can give them a flavor of dialogue and the power of that you know where you are creating a safe space where everybody is sharing the equal power you are sitting in a circle you know even the facilitator sits in a circle the entire concept of circle is so uh, amazing i would say you know where the facilitator is not in control but the facilitator shares that control with the group you know and they create a safe space for them to share fearlessly whatever they are thinking without offending each other and even if they get offended the the facilitator steps in and say that okay it's okay to feel offended let's try to understand where the other person is coming from and you know how do you still build that respect and those listening skills you know can i listen i think the most important skill that you can give a young child or a youngster which will go on with them for years is that listening you know that listening space can i can i hold that uh thing of listening to respond or listening to understand and just be there present and listen to the person through my entire presence and my entire body i would say you know how do you listen through your entire body and then just respond in a way rather than re reacting you respond where you are also sharing your perspective not to uh change or convert the other person's perspective or opinion but just with with the with the intention of contributing to that space you know so that's what we try to do uh and we'll be uh, doing that so i would say dialogue is the key i am uh, and through the samvad project i think we are experimenting that big time that if we uh have that in adults but of course as we start with young students that then it goes for the translating into adults uh, at this young age if this experience of dialogue is given to them and even for the teachers we have some programs we where we train them on dialogue skills so uh, i think that's that's the way moving forward and any closing thoughts about what you feel about yourself how do you see uh your role in the onward journey uh, regarding non violence right so for me i think over these years i have just learned one thing rajni which would i would like to share it's it's all about me you know like how um how i change myself how aware i am you know and when we talk about violence and non violence uh, as i started before that it's not just your actions or these you're slapping someone even the thoughts you know it's very natural you can't stay immune because there's a lot of violence around you i would say even when a child when a mother gives birth to a child it's it's it's, it's a violent process i would say you know there's pain involved you're breaking that wall and you're coming out any any creation 
violence is a part of it so violence is a part of our life you know so uh, you can't stay immune and say oh violence is all bad like how, how do you engage with it how do you uh, say that okay i have this thought what am i doing about it you know so all, all of these um, thoughts that i have am i aware about that you know uh, and what i'm going to do with it so be it any thought any action that i'm taking is it coming from a uh, from a space of agency like do i have agency in that or i am uh, i am in uh, i am uh, in a auto auto mode you know where i am just taking actions where i don't know why i did that so i feel that a lot of thing come with how uh, well you know yourself you know that building that self awareness component and implementing that in your life you know so when i when i hold these uh, dialogue sessions or even um, uh, interfaith dialogue sometimes i feel that you know it's not happening in my life i am not implementing that in my life can i do that first you know can i walk the talk so so it's a it's a constant struggle everyday effort you know be it gender be it uh, sexuality be it interfaith whatever is happening i try to push myself every day one step at a time challenge myself and first implement that in my life and then build it in my program so i think that way i stay grounded i realize that i am not perfect you know and the the more i read the more i learn the more i understand that i know so little you know and and i keep uh, keep trying my best so i think that that has been an approach for the past two years i would say uh, which has helped me to really deepen myself Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity.